Starting in 1953, wait, hold on a second. I'm not just gonna read off Wikipedia like every other car history video on YouTube. Nah, screw that. The first year of Corvettes in a nutshell, they were literally parts bin GM cash grabs in a pathetic attempt to compete with the growing popularity of imported European sports cars. This is gonna be a long one, boys, so take off your rose tinted goggles and put on some Zora goggles. Roll the intro. Zora has entered the chat. My man Zora was anything but a limp noodle hippie. Like, imagine if all the year one C1 apologists existed back then. We'd have a pathetic lump of GM mediocrity, or heck, the Corvette lineup just wouldn't even exist to this day and have been straight up discontinued. But thank God that ain't how the world was in the 50s. No snowflake having, fragile ego showing, safe space needing mother truckers existed back then. Zora was a serious man with a serious mission. It was thanks to his critical nature and world-renowned experience that he was able to give the first Corvette a proper review that would soon pave the future towards its eventual successor. And his review simply put was, Yo, this sucks. Zora Arcus Duntoff. Probably. And his oh-so-eloquent solution? V8. <laughs> Late Gen C1, mwah, masterpiece. Beautiful lines, bold curves, and some rather abstract designs, but it all melded together to create a unique and distinctly American sports car. Gone is the GM bargain bin Euro clone. This is when the Corvette truly was born. Gone were its dumb little baby days where it crapped itself and couldn't walk, cause now this boy moved. Oh my goodness, <laughs> they grew up so fast. 4.3 liter V8, 240 horsepower, 3 speed manual, screw your 2 speed automatic and inline 6, blah 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 blah, specs, data, statistics, numbers, who cares, you can jerk off to all this later on Wikipedia and Google. Be honest with me, that that's just stuff you can read. Anyways, what you can't read is how this car made you feel. It was exhilarating, nimble, and a work of art. This car wasn't just a showstopper everywhere it arrived, but it also was a driving show everywhere it went. You sick of the word show yet? Too bad, cause this beauty only kept getting better. More headlights, more trims, more performance, more power, more gears. The Corvette kept going up. What started off as a quick cash grab on the growing sports car market had now turned into a serious competitor with its eyes set on the stars but its heart set in the people. Because above all else, the Corvette was affordable. A factor so important to its core design that it would go on to define every single Corvette that would be released from that moment onwards anywhere and everywhere. Yes, even in parallel dimensions. Fact! as I've jumped through multiple dimensions and can confirm that the Corvette is always still a bargain. No matter how many butterflies are trampled on, or how much the past has changed, or how many wars happen, rest assured, the Corvette's price will always be within reach. Not even quantum physics can get in the way of the Corvette's affordability. Because of this, the Corvette quickly became a symbol of American freedom as an everlasting testament that hard work could grant you your dream. And with the endless march of time came yet another addition to the Corvette lineage, the C2. A car considered so beautiful that even the most hardcore elitist Euro snobs take out their cigar, puff away, and nod in respect as they mutter to themselves, Damn, now that's a real car. This insane body line that stretches all the way around the Corvette's exterior completely uninterrupted symbolized the everlasting continuity of America's commitment to freedom and the pursuit of liberty. Just kidding, I made that up just now, but that's probably what it stands for. Regardless, this signature line would become a defining feature that would be showcased on every single Corvette onwards. That way, no matter who laid eyes upon it, they'd always be able to trace back its lineage to the origin of the C2 and conclude that the car that they're looking at isn't some Italian exotic, but in fact an American Corvette. So despite being mid-engine, the C8 Corvette still features this line, as well as the masculine sharp angular appearance and most importantly, the signature ramped stance that Corvettes have always been known for. So to all the artistically challenged scrub lords saying that it looks like an Italian exotic now, look, I've already made a video discussing this. The point is, this is such a distinctly Corvette design, alright? Just, just get out of here, alright? Alright? There's the video. Go watch it. Moving along now. The C3. Big block baby. 454 cubic inches of raw, unfiltered American V8. 435 horsepower made it to a man's gearbox. You mean manual? No, man's! Then California came in and was like, you guys might want to take a look at this. 
Aw, oh, get the hell out of here, you hippie. Yeah, no, we don't want none of that. No, guys, I'm serious. The Middle East won't give us oil anymore. Uh-oh. So the big block noodle energy got replaced with small block lymph noodle energy. The legendary Brummel Brummel of the 435 horsepower V8 was shafted up the wazoo and out came its red-haired stepchild that no one asked for, the small block V8, which in 1975 made a pathetically low power output of just 175 horsepower. But hush up, child, be steady and steal your heart, for you may yet still grow a set of wings with jagged feathers and serrated edges that cut through the skies. But for now, you're just a little wimp. Sorry, mate. With our hindsight, we now know the legendary L line of small block engines would someday reach heights that no pushrod or hell no V8 in general has ever gone before. However, at this point in time, it was just a crying baby that constantly kept wetting itself, and that also summarizes the redesign of the C3 in later years too, because look at how sad and droopy this is, compared to the perky, bright, chrome-bumpered brethren of former years. During this time, the Corvette would be outclassed by many foreign sports cars with much smaller engines due to mission regulations and how much its V8 had to be neutered. This wasn't just a dark time for the Corvette, but a dark time for all of American muscle, as even the Mustang King Cobra only had 130 horsepower. The C3 would trudge onwards very slowly to the end of its generation, where after a long 15 years of seeing this car, it would finally come to an end. 1983 came by and the Corvette wouldn't release a new model year, but production would still continue. Therefore, since the Corvette was still being produced, it would still retain its title of longest running nameplate, a title that the design team at the time wouldn't realize that they'd hold all the way to this day. Soon enough, 1984 arrived, and with it... You think I'm actually gonna talk about the C4? The most appreciated, least valuable, least memorable Vaporwave 80s dated fake digital dash wannabe car ever to exist? <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll at least talk about the Grand Sport and ZR1. I'll give you that. Hmm? What's this? The late generation C4s are responsible for the birth of the first generation of the LT lineup, your C7. You have a second generation LT. Thank me later. Signed, C4. Much love. Oh, you see, what I meant to say was, the C4 is the greatest Corvette ever. LT, LT, long live the Vaporwave 80s, and then the 90s hit. And we had to lay our eyes on this wretched, overly plastered car that was found in every single McDonald's kids meal, every single Hot Wheels bin, every single Gran Turismo playing, Midnight Club having, Forza loving, Midlife Crisis starting, Boomer mobiling, headlight popping car that was the C5. Oh, and the... Thank you, Mr. Regler. Anyways, what do you do when your puny Japanese engine breaks down after only a measly 300,000 miles? LS swap, look at it go. 778,000 on the original engine is the current record and they're still going. You thought American cars weren't reliable? Think again. British cars started to use LS, Italian cars started to use LS, Australian cars started to use LS, and even Japanese cars started to use LS. Does it stand for luxury sport? Nah, it stands for legendary status. If you want a cheap, affordable, reliable power, smacking an LS in was the only way to go. Mazda Miata? LS swap. Honda Civic? LS swap. Toyota Camry? LS swap. Uh, Bladed, didn't you already do this bit in another video? Hell yeah I did and we're doing it again. Corvette C5? Doesn't matter if it already has one in. Put another one in. LS swap. Mazda RX-7? <laughs> you thought I was gonna say nope, not this time. LS swap, goodbye bad bad rotary and hello good good LS. Just kidding, please save the rotaries. Every like on this video helps feed a starving rotary child by giving them brand new Apex seals. And in just a short seven to eight years, we already got tired of seeing the C5 because it was literally everywhere as I mentioned. So then we had the C6 roll along and bye bye pop-up headlights and hello sock puppet bottom feeder. Strangely enough, the LS2 is easily the most forgotten LS engine ever exists. Its short production span was immediately overshadowed by the infinitely better LS3. That would basically cost the same, but be a lot more powerful, be more reliable, and be put into literally everything. As even in brand new cars, halfway across the world a decade later, such as the Holden VF Commodore SS, but fortunately, it didn't come alone, as its big brother tagged along shortly after. The LS7. 7 liters, 427, big block energy has returned. 505 horsepower, naturally aspirated, go f*** yourself, this is America where freedom is free and something something liberty. 
And it gets better, cause you haven't seen anything yet. 2009 ZR1, supercharged LS9 and the first Corvette to ever be sold for over 100 grand from factory, not counting the weird one-off models made by special companies. Anyways, uh, what? Uh oh, this doesn't look too good. The bumpy recession of 2008 started to settle into 2009, and in spite of all the excitement that the Zero One gained, the reality was that America, and really the rest of the world, weren't exactly in a mood to welcome it. And even within the company, that wasn't in the mood to do much welcoming to the Corvette, but rather more farewells. Among the many GM factory worker layoffs, the people at Bowling Green and the Corvette factory also weren't immune, and perhaps one of the most pivotal moments in modern Corvette history was when the current chief engineer of the Corvette, Wallace, decided to take GM's early retirement offer, because times were rough and money was scarce. This would leave Taj Juecter as the next in line to inherit the title of Chief Engineer, a title that almost didn't mean anything, as serious talk of discontinuing the Corvette and indefinitely cancelling the C7 project were in the works, but Juecter valiantly said no. And I'm saying his name like the Italian way, which is Juecter, because it's spelled like that, and not the German way, which is Juecter, sorry if I'm butchering your name. But if you are watching this video by chance, we're gonna call you TJ from now on. And after one of the worst storms a Corvette ever had to weather through, it would wash ashore to the introduction of its 7th generation. Surely, after a rocky recession just like that, the newest Corvette would tone it down a bit, right? Not in your dreams, baby! 460 horsepower, Z51, 6-speed automatic, 7-speed manual, oh wait, what, what's that I hear? An 8-speed automatic now, do I hear 9? Can I get a 9? No? No? 10? Is there a 10? 10 goes to the Camaro? Okay, but you know what the Camaro doesn't get? This checkered flag and this fleur de lis. God bless the Corvette and say hello to its stunning exotic design. New headlights, new. Carbon fiber roof and hood, carbon. Thick, beautiful hips, hips. And, and, excuse me. What's this? Oh, well, those are the tail lights. You mean Optimus Prime? Wow, I can't believe it doesn't have the round tail lights anymore. Yeah, I know, right? Even the rest of the design is a sensible step forward from the previous generation, but the tail lights? No, GM. This time, you've gone too far. You've changed, GM. The recession has changed you. Back in my day, Corvettes used to have generic round taillights like thousands of other cars like the $5 ones you saw on buses. Kids these days and their overwhelming talent to create inspired designs wouldn't understand the minimalism and lack of passion it took us old folk to appreciate totally boring and effortless design. Uh, guys, chill. It's just the taillights. Literally the rest of the design. Don't you it's just the taillights, me? I'll have you know we won't soon forget the atrocity you've brought upon us, you disgusting, home-wrecking, exotic European wannabe heathens. A few moments later. Oh yeah! The new Corvette rocks! Z06, baby! Yo, did y'all hear? The Z06 is out! Uh, I know, uh, I am one. Yeah, bro, aren't they sick? No, I'm pretty healthy, actually. Yeah, okay, bro. Anyways, I can't help but feel like we're forgetting something. Like we were really upset about something... whatever. <laughs> Oh, and then the Zero One came along, and then everyone just lost their collective sh because the front engine Corvette had five been considered a supercar. But before we can really rejoice about the front engine glory that was the Zero One, Chevy had something to finally discuss internally, which was that even though Zora was the one who dreamt of the mid engine Corvette, the reality is the dead can't speak. What they can do, however, is leave behind a legacy memories, dreams, all etched into the skies above. And should someone still living muster up the courage to shatter those skies and unveil the dream hidden behind, can the world fully realize it? Five generations, almost 50 years, this man lived and breathed Corvette. And when Zora stopped breathing, TJ made sure to keep breathing in his place. Time and time again, they tried to go mid-engine, to finish Zora's legacy, and time and time again, something got in their way. From times before and after the recession, the mid-engine Corvette would just be another myth to ride away in the books. Or so we thought. More than a decade later, GM came once more to ask TJ a question. Hey, can you lead a design team to make a mid-engine Corvette? And this time, Juecter said, yes. 
While Carroll Shelby is rolling in his grave at the side of the Mustang Mach-E, even down here from Earth, I can feel Zora all the way up in heaven, laughing and smacking Shelby's back as he declares in excitement, THAT'S MY BOY! TJ was asked on multiple occasions to turn the Corvette into an SUV, but he chose to stay true to the customer and creator lineage. In summary, his response was, if you want a Corvette SUV, just go buy another Chevrolet SUV. Chevrolet already makes a bunch of SUVs. Why should people expect a Chevrolet to turn the Corvette into one? The reason people buy a Corvette is because they want a two-door, rear-wheel drive, V8 sports car. If it's gonna have this checkered flag and fly this Fleur de Lis, it ain't gonna be on an SUV. And if the engine was moved behind you, truth be told, I could care less if it was moved back in front, on the middle, up in the sky, at the core. The Corvette stayed just as TJ promised, and just as Zora wanted. Two-door, rear-wheel drive, V8, and... Okay, maybe the last part has changed. How about supercar? The Corvette nameplate was sacred, strong, consistent, but more than anything, was courageous. By birthright, it wasn't a supercar, just the parts bin GM throwaway, meant to look as pretty as its competitors, but not actually drive anything like them. Yet with the guidance of engineers, the purchases of devoted customers, model after model, year after year, decade after decade, and even a half a century later and counting, from inline 6 to V8, from big block to small block, from supercharged pushrod to twin turbo flat plane, at the time of this video's creation, the C8's journey has only just begun. Yet I find joy in wondering what people watching this video five years later are commenting. However, I get the feeling I already know, that the Corvette had finally grown a set of wings with jagged feathers and serrated edges that cut through the skies like a bladed angel.